morning, everybody. Thanks again for taking out the time to, to join us this morning. It's great to have you all here. Just a, a quick heads up, uh, the Plumbing Industry Awards are starting again after a two-year absence. So on the 28th of July, we'll be having our uh, a big awards dinner and ceremony uh, in Centurion. So if you and your staff maybe are interested, uh, please feel free to join us. Uh, you can contact Kayla at uh, the email address below there. And um, there's also sponsorship packages available if anybody is interested in that. So let's kick on with it. So today we're going to be talking about uh, uh, pollution of fresh water resources. Uh, my name is Brendan Reynolds. Um, and uh, the big thing to talk about really today is, uh, is the, the pollution that's coming through rainwater disposal into uh, sewer networks, which is ending up in our rivers and streams. Now, uh, it's estimated that around 5 billion litres of, um, of raw sewage is entering our freshwater resources on a daily basis. A large percentage of that is coming through our wastewater treatment plants, which are not working very well at all. Um, in fact, I think something like 2% of all our wastewater treatment plants are functioning correctly at this stage. But uh, as plumbers, we've got an impact on this too. Um, and uh, most of us have seen uh, incidences where, where rainwater is being disposed of into sewers and uh, that causes the manholes to pop open. So that's really what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, some of these slides you may have seen before, I pinched them from Adrian because uh, I think he did a great job in putting together these slides from a previous presentation. But let's just talk quickly about the National Building Regulations. Uh, part P3, the control of objectionable discharge. And uh, I'm not going to read all the clauses, but basically what it says is no person will allow uh, 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 sewage or any other uh, objectionable uh, materials or, or, or effluent to enter the, the water course. Uh, this, is, this is a regulation. It's a law, um, it's, not, it's not a standard or anything, although that is included in the standards, but it really is, the law is quite clear, uh, it shall not be done. So if we have a look at, uh, even though the law says this, and it, and it says said this for, for many, many, many years, I think probably 30 or 40 years, we still see it all the time. Um, and, and these two photos look fairly innocuous, but uh, the one on the left is, uh, is showing that the, the gully head has been removed. And so rainwater, every time it rains, the rainwater will enter into the sewer there. Uh, and on the right is, uh, is a downpipe entering into the gully. Uh, and we see this all over, all the time. In fact, we're busy with a, um, a piece of research now where we're looking at, uh, at these types of installations in homes. Um, and so far, we've looked at about 120, 130 um, homes already, and, uh, and about 30 to 40% of those homes have these type of, types of installations. So you can imagine if 30 to 40% of all homes in South Africa have these type of installations, the amount of uh, rainwater that's being discharged into our sewer systems. Uh, here's another example, and here's multiple downpipes, and the gully head, is no, there's no gully head there. So all the rainwater from, from this side of the house, and probably from, from virtually the whole house, will be disposing into the sewer system. We see these quite often, in, especially in townhouse complexes, very often in the courtyard. Um, the, the developers or the architects or the builders or whoever it is, uh, just uh, think that the sewer is a great way to dispose of rainwater. And so uh, in very many courtyards, you see this type of thing, which, uh, which is disposing rainwater directly into the sewer system. Uh, we've even, uh, one of our members quite recently was busy with a, a whole green project and, uh, and the project planner had them uh, washing the, the dustbins and, and all that sort of thing uh, into something similar to this, a little gully that, uh, that then discharges into the sewer. And that, that is completely illegal uh, and for very good reason. If you think about 
uh, rainwater, and uh, you know, if we look at uh, if a house has a, a 10 by 10 uh, square meter roof and they receive 10 millimeters of rain, uh, that will produce a thousand liters of water. And if you look uh, just the other day in Gauteng, we had uh, we had 50 mils between 50 and 100 mils, uh, uh, depending on which area you were. Uh, that would have then been 5,000 to 10,000 liters per home. And that's only if they've got a 10 by 10 square meter roof. If you've got a complex or a factory or an or a office building or something like that, and you've got 50 by 50 square meters and you have 10 mils of rain, that's 25,000 liters of water entering the, the sewage system. Now, it only becomes really meaningful when one uh, starts to look at a suburb, uh, say a suburb with a with a thousand houses, uh, and if our stats are correct, if forty percent of them have uh, this type of installation, then you start looking at four hundred times uh, this sort of volume of water, uh, and and then you can start to see that you might have something like a million liters or or even more entering into a sewer system which was never designed to, uh, to hold that volume of water. And as we all know uh, from previous tech talks, and I think everybody will know that a, that a sewer pipe is designed not to run full all the time. And uh, so what this does is obviously fills the, the pipe. Uh, the pipe comes under pressures that it shouldn't be uh, kept under because of the huge volume of water. And, uh, and it damages the pipes, damages the infrastructure, damages the manholes. Obviously manhole covers pop open. And uh, we see this sort of thing. Uh, most suburbs in, in South Africa, when there's a rainstorm, you'll end up seeing something like this somewhere around town. Um, and that is, that is very often raw sewage that's just pouring out of a manhole, lifts the manhole cover. And where does that water end up? It all ends up, oh, sorry, yeah, and besides the fact that uh, it can enter a house if, if there isn't a proper gully done uh, and you can have large damage to, to a property. Uh, a lady just down the road from me who lives in a bit of a dip uh, in that recent very, very heavy rain that we had in Gauteng, um, the entire house was flooded uh, 200 mils with uh, right throughout the house, about 200 mils of sewage right throughout the house. It's an absolute nightmare. So where does it all end up? It all ends up somehow in our rivers and dams. So as the manhole overflows, um, all the raw sewage ends up going into a stormwater drain um, or it drains into uh, one of the natural water, water courses, a stream or a dam or something like that, which enters the rivers. And from the rivers, it ends up in our, um, in our, our uh, treatment plants in our dams and our treatment plants. So this is just, uh, this is just one of the rivers that's uh, really heavily polluted. It's the, it's the Henops, uh, but uh, we see the same thing in the Yuxke, in the Val, um, down in Cape Town, in KwaZulu-Natal. <clears throat> You'll know, the guys down at the coast will know that uh, it's quite a, quite a normal thing now uh, for beaches to be closed due to E. coli, uh, and that's coming from raw sewage in the, um, in the rivers that's ending up in even in the ocean. So what happens when uh, and why is it so bad that raw sewage ends up in our uh, freshwater resources? Um, it causes a, a thing called eutrophication. It's a very fancy name. Um, and basically what it means is that uh, the, the uh, water gets enriched uh, through the through the effluent through raw sewage, the same thing happens in agricultural areas where um, um, fertilizers and that sort of thing end up in the uh, in the water sources. And most of our water sources are vulnerable to this kind of degradation. Um, it has been estimated, and this comes from 2013, so it's about ten, nearly 10 years old. I'm sure it's quite quite a lot worse by now. But at this point in time, there was some research done uh, that one in five of our dams um, is, is, is eutrified. Um, and uh, 18 out of the 25 major rivers 
are eutified. Now, what happens with eutification is, uh, I think we've all probably seen it, you get this blue-green algae bloom uh, that happens in the water. Uh, it, it, it doesn't look quite natural, but it's this heavy, deep, blue-green sort of color that, that starts spreading throughout the water. Uh, people that have, have been to Hartebeespoort Dam or uh, live around Hartebeespoort Dam will see this quite regularly. It's a regular occurrence. And, uh, and, and what happens is that generates a thing called cyanobacteria, and these produce toxins. Um, and actually, we have quite widespread throughout the country. Uh, we, have, uh, we have seen poisoning of, of domestic and wild animals. Uh, because they're drinking from these streams and dams and it actually occurs quite often. Uh, now obviously these toxic blooms are um, quite a big threat to the supply of safe drinking water to, to the whole of South Africa, to each and every single one of us. Uh, and the economic costs of these can run into hundreds of, of, of millions of rands every year and as a country we just simply cannot afford that uh, at this point in time and, and the cleanup is virtually uh, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's really, really difficult to do because it takes a lot of money to sort out uh, these uh, freshwater resources. Obviously, um, it affects the poor and the vulnerable more than, uh, than everybody else. You've got to know that um, there's, there's actually millions of people in South Africa that use um, our, our natural rivers and dams as drinking water for their livestock, for their crops. Uh, for animals to drink from, uh, for washing their clothes, all this sort of thing. Uh, and these poor people are being exposed to some really, really nasty um, toxins. So what are the effects of eutrophication um, and of the cyanobacteria? So we see an increased incident of uh, fish kills. Again, it's something we see from time to time, and, and maybe some of you have, have seen this in a river system or a dam system where just thousands and thousands of fish just die and, and lie on the surface. Um, it leads to a loss of biodiversity. Um, in fact, there was a study done recently in the Henops River, um, basically from, uh, uh, from uh, Irene. They, they did a test from Irene into Centurion. Um, it's about three odd kilometers, I think, of river. Um, and they pretty much found zero life. Uh, not a crab, not a frog, not a fish. Um, nothing. There, there was pretty much zero, zero life there in the river. And, and the main, main reason for that um, is, is raw sewage entering the river system. Um, what's important to the whole of the country besides that is the, is the increased cost of uh, potable water treatment. So obviously, uh, when this horrible water ends up at the water treatment plant, uh, they've got to take extra work. It requires extra chemicals, extra testing, uh, all sorts of things to, um, to treat the water to a state that, that, it, that it can be used by us. Um, these toxins obviously can be fatal to humans and animals. Um, and it, it has significant ne negative ecological consequences, not only on the river system, but on, on the ecology around that. So we've seen, for example, in the Vaal, um, where, where trees on the riverbank are now starting to die uh, as a result of this. And then that obviously leads to a whole set of, of different consequences. Uh, so you can see that it's not just the actual river system, but it starts to spread beyond the river system. Uh, it leads to things like diarrhea, cholera, and other waterborne diseases. Um, it reduces property values for, for properties that are near or, or on these freshwater systems. Um, has a negative impact on tourism. Um, and there's obviously a high health risk for people that, uh, that use these systems for swimming or skiing or fishing or whatever it is. So it has quite uh, massive consequences. And, and to say that this is an epidemic in South Africa, I think would, would actually be an understatement. Um, it really is a massive crisis and we as plumbers um, have, have a role to play. Uh, the, the wastewater treatment plant's probably bigger, but we definitely have a role to play. There's another thing um, that's quite a modern thing and it's just starting to come out now. Uh, and, uh, and, and this falls under the heading of uh, uh, 
emerging pollutants um, that are leading to the spread of superbugs. So again, I think most people have heard about these superbugs in hospitals. Um, some people pick up these superbugs that are uh, that that um, they resistant to all sorts of drugs and to antibiotics and all these sort of things. But uh, we're seeing a growing number of superbugs, and uh, what's happening is that uh, poor uh, treatment of wastewater. Uh, they're not they're not able to kill all the bugs in the water. Um, during the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and the, they're mainly using chlorine, um, and that kills the weaker bugs, the weaker bacteria and viruses and that sort of thing. But the stronger ones survive and they actually get stronger and they start to build up an immunity to the things that we use to treat them. Um, these are quotes, these, uh, these are four, four quotes here from um, scientists and doctors in South Africa. Uh, and you can see the second one is, we are slowly running out of drugs for treatment. Um, so so if, if you've had anybody, a family member or somebody that's been in hospital and picked up a superbug, um, you'll know that how difficult it is to, to treat those people and they really are struggling with this. Uh, you also got to remember, remember now what happens is uh, all of us are taking antibiotics, analgesics, blood pressure things, hormones, uh, besides things like, you know, uh, drugs and, 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 and that sort of thing. Uh, and all these things are, uh, they only get partially metabolized in our body. So when you go to the loo, um, these things come out in your urine and your stool. Um, plus we're flushing down the, the, the toilet, all sorts of chemicals, detergents, soaps, and all this sort of thing. Uh, and you can see this next quote. Uh, we, where, where this professor said, what keeps me awake at night is when we mix industrial effluent with human sewage. What is going to happen to the pathogens as they mix with thousands of chemicals from factories and obviously all these other things that, that are entering the wastewater. Now, normally this would be contained in a sewer system and then it would end up in the wastewater treatment plant and it could be dealt with. But what's happening is this, this, this raw effluent is ending up in our rivers and streams. And you end up with this, with this cocktail um, and nobody actually knows. The scientists have no idea what can come out of that, that cocktail, you know, um, what sort of new bacteria or viruses or mutations and things can come out of this. It kind of reminds me of those old comic books we used to read as kids. You know, and somebody falls into this cocktail of chemical some things, and then they come out as a, as a as a monster or a superhero or something like that. I know it sounds like science fiction, but uh, it's it's real, and this uh, this is from scientists. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, we have a role to play, uh, and we need to we need to be a very 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 cautious about following the, the laws and regulations and making sure that raw sewage is not ending up in, in our natural water courses. So what can we do about it? So first and foremost is uh, to familiarize yourself with the regulations. We obviously, as IOPSA often, um, you know, sort of, sort of um, educate the community about what the regulations and the standards and things say, but also have a look at your bylaws. Uh, the vast majority of bylaws in South Africa absolutely strictly prohibit this type of activity. When you see this, not only when you're doing a job on, on somebody's rainwater or, or sewer system, but uh, even if you're doing another, another type of work at somebody's home and you see this type of thing, please explain the legal and environmental imp implications to the clients. They need to understand this. We all know how clients and homeowners are. They just want the rainwater to, do, to go away. They just want their poo to flush down the, the toilet and that's it, they don't, they don't really care. Um, so we need to explain to them the impact of, of what that installation is doing to uh, not only to our municipal infrastructure, but, uh, but to the, the environment. Uh, it presents an opportunity to you. So invest, investigate what, uh, what is being done, why it's happening, and uh, propose some alternatives. Rainwater harvesting is a great one. 
but one can also look at subsoil drainage um, and, and various other things. So uh, it's an opportunity for, for you guys to perhaps earn some additional income um, and, and correct these things. We've got to look at our infrastructure. Uh, it's, uh, it's estimated that it's going to cost 900 billion, that's billion with a B, to fix uh, the infrastructure in South Africa. Um, and yet this type of installation, while it seems like a nothing, it, it, it seems like it's not, uh, it's not a really big deal. It actually is a massive deal because it is seriously damaging the infrastructure. So uh, these sewer pipes in the ground, the manholes, the manhole covers, um, and even the wastewater treatment plant, when, when all this water, when all this rainwater hits the wastewater treatment plant, um, it, it destroys valves, um, it, uh, it kills the, the natural bacteria that are there that help treat the water, uh, it disturbs the whole wastewater treatment system, um, and it costs a lot of money to clean it up and to fix it after these storms. So we need to do our bit also to protect the, the infrastructure. And we've got to look at our, our environment. Guys, the, the, for too long, we as human beings have, have not cared about the environment and we've continued to just do as we please. Um, and we're going to reap the benefits of that. Uh, we, we're going to suffer the consequences. We've got to, for our children's sake and for our grandchildren's sake, we've got to start thinking about the environment and everything we do. Um, if, we, if we destroy our water systems in South Africa, we're going we're gonna to face some very, very, very serious uh, consequences. Just do the right thing, you know. I mean, it, it, besides, forget about the regulations, forget about the standards, forget about the bylaws. Let's just do the right thing. If we know that it's wrong and we know what the impacts are, let's just do the right thing. Uh, because, because it's important for us. We live in this community. Uh, we, we work in this community. Uh, our kids are going to grow up in this community. So, so do the right thing for, for your community and, and for yourselves and your family. Um, you really can make a difference. Um, as usual, you know, I have to rush through these things because it's not always easy to get through everything. Um, I have missed out a lot of detail and there is a lot of scientific information um, that is available. Just Google it, guys. There's a huge amount of information about this topic, um, and it really is becoming a very hot topic at the moment because our rivers and dams are in some serious trouble. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Byron, any questions? Um, Comments? We do have a question here yeah? when they say here, yeah. when you come across these, I'm um, guessing that's across the rainwater pipes dumping and sewage line, where client brought the house and complex. Where do you complain if the developer thus lifts his shoulders and clients feels he's not responsible in Western Cape? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And that happens a lot. So somebody buys uh, into one of these townhouse complexes or, or blocks of flats or whatever, um, and and you come across exactly this thing. And then and then it's a question of whose problem is it? So uh, the only place you actually can effectively report it to is to uh, the municipality, to the building control officer. It should be something that the building control officer takes very, very seriously. Um, but definitely, I suggest that you report it to the, the building control officer. Uh, but we know that in, in, in most cases, very little uh, will be done uh, because of that. So unfortunately, it's going to be a discussion that needs to be held with the body corporate um, and the homeowner. Um, and, you know, if, if they've been informed that uh, the installation is illegal, uh, then, it, then it is their responsibility. I know it doesn't sound right, and I know the developer should be held responsible. But uh, ultimately, it's going to be a discussion that needs to be had with the body corporate and the, and the homeowners. Very tricky one. Thank you. I don't think there are any other questions. Well, thank you, guys. Um, thank you for your time again. And uh, uh, let's get out there and have a great day.